Okay, I'm uh, welcome to Art and Activism. It's a web series brought to you by Women, Women's Eco Art Dialogue, we. Um, in this series, we will discuss ways that artists actively engage in creating climate solutions and promoting sustainability. We at WEED believe that art can be a powerful tool for raising awareness and prompting social change. In this web series, we are looking at ways that artists are actively engaged in creating climate situations and promoting sustainability. Today, we have episode number five, Artists, Essential Workers and Visionaries with artist Betsy Damon. Betsy Damon is an internationally acclaimed artist. In 1991, she started Keepers of the Waters, working towards creating community-based models of water stewardship. She instigated China's first art event for the environment, which led to the building of the Living Water Garden, a world-famous urban public park designed as a seven-stage natural water cleaning system. She's the, she promotes public consciousness of living water and invites us to place water itself as the foundation of all planning and design. Please stick around with us after her talk for 30 minutes in which we'll have a bit of a Q and A. Thank you. And we're ready for you, Betsy. Oh, thank you, Kate. Okay, first I do wanna thank Weed. Um, and I would like to mention Joe Hansen uh, as a, um, I would say, in a way a mentor, but a peer. But I used to sit in her kitchen and talk to her as I came and went back from China. And um, uh, very, and I know that we grew out of um, her relationships to a number of people in the Bay Area. And we was the first group like this, really fantastic group. So I feel very honored to be here with you. Um, we are all, this quote on my screen uh, is something that I wrote to the director of the Modern Museum in Warsaw, Poland about a month ago. He was extremely discouraged by what's happened in his country. And I wrote him this and he said, I wanna spray paint what you wrote all over all the walls. But in fact, it's true. We've all gone through our times of being locked down in various ways, not only by COVID, but by politics, um, by people who are in control and really cannot, um, what, what I said to him is they can't function from love, which I don't, um, yeah, I say that in here too, but uh, they, they can't, they don't. And um, we do the best we can to model something else, um, but you know, we all know what it's like to be up against that, even in, and in this current time in our own country. It's the, I would consider the vast abyss that we still have to cross with, to stop a lot of things, to change things so that every human being is honored so that we have a livable planet um, in the future. Uh, and, I'm gonna try and talk to that uh, just from my own, where, I, where, where I'm at with it in spite of everything I've done or haven't done. So let's see, we'll go for it. Whoops, isn't it changing? Which one do I push? Okay, okay. so I'm backing up a little while. Um, and I became a feminist within one hour. Uh, there is no question in my mind. And back then in uh, 68, it was just beginning. Uh, and by the time I had two children by 71, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but virtually hard to have a career and have two children. And uh, everyone was looking at me, analyzing me, coming over to my house to see if my children were okay because I was an artist and many other things. Anyway, I stepped down into the streets to take space. I decided that my whole education had been about male artists and it had been. Um, and so I, how do I find my female, me as a female? And I started making work based on my dreams and I dreamed of my body covered with bags and I stepped out in the streets in Manhattan in this form, the 7,000 year old woman. I'm not gonna go into all these pieces 
that's uh, I cut the bags off my body. Um, the little girls were there, but the boys ran in the circle and collected the bags and started throwing them around. Um, some Italians from, it was the Italian district at that time on the edge of Soho and some Italians threw eggs also at the, at the piece. They didn't hit anybody. But, um, and I was a very shy person actually. And this piece catapulted me into visibility. I won't go into all that, but I ended up being invited to Europe and many things. So the next thing I thought about, well, where, who are the women storytellers? Who carries our stories? And I decided to be a, like a, a begging for stories from people's lives. And this is on Wall Street. And um, I went with a friend of mine who was blind from birth. Um, and I was there for an hour and people, I begged, it took 20 minutes of me saying, every, every day something important happens to you and um, I would like to hear what it is. And it took 20 minutes and then people started talking to me and telling me. And I did this piece in many locations. So finally, um, time, time and space, I have to put all this work together into something, but I had, um, I had a thing on my mind. I had got, traveled out west on a camping trip with my children and I saw the dry river beds. I also had a relationship with stones and my father had worry stones in his pocket and I loved stones and I would collect them. So I decided to do a meditation with stones for the survival of the planet. And the first piece was on the streets in Soho. Then we did it on every full moon in a gallery. And then I also did it up in front of the Natural History Museum. But th that director of the Natural History Museum forgot to tell the guards that I was gonna do this. And so they shut down the piece. But this piece led me to, really people cried. I asked people what they would, um, everybody in the, in the bigger pieces got healed by the group. And I would ask people to pledge what they were gonna do or what they wanted to save on the planet. And one time I was doing this piece in Minnesota at a rock concert and there were about 70 people in the circle and um, you had to wash your stone as you came in. And a little boy was holding my hand and I kept saying, do you wanna talk now? And he'd say, no. And finally, he was the last person, you know what he said? He said, I just want you to keep doing this till it gets right. So many experiences like this um, eventually led me to, I always question, what's the impact of my work? Was that anything? Did any, anything happen? Did anything happen at all? I always ask that question. And um, that what I love about performance artists, you do it and it doesn't, you don't have, you don't leave anything. It, it doesn't have a footprint necessarily. And I actually really love that. And I think that that's important. And I, a lot of things happened I, for people in the performance events because they, I got bigger and did sort of large group events where I do a workshop with people and they were starting to remember things that had happened to them and they'd find their also their, their icon, female icon and all that kind of stuff. Um, but so I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm always searching for what's around the corner. It's like wanting to know what's at the end of the beach. What happens if I do this? So I'm happy to be into sort of endless experiments and tests. But I had seen all these dry riverbeds when I took my children across country. And I didn't realize that we had dammed the United States. When I went across the United States, I could swim in creeks. Um, when I was a child in the, in the 50s. And that was all gone. I went across the United States with my children in 83, all gone. And so I decided to make a piece to tell people about rivers or creeks. And at first I was gonna call it something about, you know, rivers. And then I learned about how they had all been dammed. So I called it a memory of clean water. Now that's already, uh, 1985. And when I called it that, people said to me, you're exaggerating. Even though the front page of the, of the time 
magazine was about dry lands and waters disappearing and the quality of water dying. But nobody wanted to know about that. So anyway, this creek we did and the, the creek was um, basically the water on the spic public spigots were all not potable. Now I'm in an unsettled valley in Utah and nothing's potable. Why not? From farming and mining had polluted the water for hundreds of miles around. But, but absolutely nobody wanted to know this. So here I got a group of paper makers. Well, I was starting No Limits for Women Artists. And I said to them in the car, if you had enough money on everything, what would you do? And they told me, and then they, I was in Canada, and then they turned around, they asked me the same question. And I said, well, I can't do what I wanna do. And they said, well, what is it? And I said, I wanna cast 250 feet of a riverbed in handmade paper. And they said, um, we'll help you, we'll help you. And so then the, the most incredible paper makers gathered and we spent a whole month doing this project. Now again, why doesn't it go down? <laughs> oh, I have to do this, okay. Just don't click anymore. Okay, so that's um, taking the riverbed up. It's in sections. And we were a crew of about 10 people. Um, ah, and then that's it in a gallery. And I still have it. Uh, some friends wanted to buy sections, but for some reason I've kept it. And I was thinking that it would just, you know, I'll just put it in the trash or something, but it got exhibited a little bit. And, now I'm trying to figure out maybe there's a home for it and maybe it has more meaning beyond what happened in um, 1985. <laughs> and it did travel and everything like that. But, and I would talk to people about water and people knew nothing. They knew nothing. Um, so let's see. So, um, skip over time and I decided as a result of casting that piece because one day after being on the riverbed for 10 hours, the sky was turning that indigo blue and the stars were coming out. And I looked up at it and I thought, oh my God, this looks just like the river. And um, I realized that everything in the world is patterned by water and that I did not know anything. I mean, I knew nothing. And I decided to give my life to water, whatever that meant, whatever my skills were, whatever I could do. So my first job was to learn about water. And um, you can't learn about water. Water is way more than, you know, three, three stages of a hydraulic cycle. It's way more than you, what comes out of your tap. It's, so I sent out, and again, I'm not gonna, this talk is not gonna be to teach you all about water, except I'm gonna say that they have now discovered and are on the verge of discovering that water is consciousness and memory. Phys even physicists are admitting this. It's not just a woo-woo science of emoto. Uh, so I'll, I will so show you quickly this, the living water and the dead water. And what's the difference? The difference is that there's tiny little microbes in the living water and the dead water has none. And those tiny little microbes are essential for us to have and other life forms to actually have in the water. They're part of what make water the creative force that it is. Um, all right. And I'll show you one more picture, which is, this is part of a whole series, but the drop of water falls down um, into, this is into a vat of water and it, it, it makes all these different forms and then it comes back up to meet the next drop. Now that's power, that's creative power beyond which any of us can really understand. Okay, so uh, just quickly, um, water does embrace all the sciences. And one of the things that's been wrong with the sciences is they don't embrace each other. And finally, now we have biophysics, biochemistry. They are starting to embrace each other. It's essential to understand the living system that these sciences 
become integrated. You can't understand complexity with the way things have been structured or even how a physicist has to prove that they're right by isolating something <clears throat> completely. And although they realize that that's not, doesn't provide truth, the discipline is slowly changing. <laughs> um, so I can't actually see my screen because the faces are on top of it. <laughs> Can you get rid of that? Thanks. Oh, okay. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so as I understand it, I would say water is the singular agent of all creation. And the re restoration of our waters is so basic to, to resilience and complexity that if we could restore our waters and we would really no water, we would clean everything up. It would not even be hard. We're not there yet. No, no it's not going forward. <laughs> Why isn't it? Okay. Okay, now, and some of you have seen some of these slides, but pretty soon I hope things will be new. So I found an ancient, um, beautifully etched book about the human body. And um, I made a series, which I have not ever published called Your Body is Water. But if I only say this one thing, the, what looks like a tree is actually a river system. And um, I always say that now most of this river system, you can just take it apart, straighten it out, obliterate all the small streams and everything. And you have what's happened to probably the most big, large rivers in our world. So I sort of say, how many of our veins and arteries could you move, remove, take somewhere else before you die? All right, <laughs> I have to go quickly because I'm good. Anyway, um, so, through a series of extraordinary things that are highly unusual, I ended up in China. Um, on a phone, anonymous phone call, um, I was given $15,000 to go back to China and try and do something. And my friends generously raised almost another 10,000. I applied for a number of grants, but they, no, nobody funded China. So this is some of the people from the very first Keepers of the Waters event in Chengdu in 1995. Now you have to remember that Tiananmen Square had happened. Um, public art was forbidden, foreigners were forbidden. Um, but I, now some people have recently asked me like many questions, but when I went there, I had no doubt but that we would not succeed. I had no doubt and I went without a, I went on a tourist visa, which means you can't do anything and all kinds of obstacles, but I never had any doubt in my mind. And what I'm going to invite you to do, and I forgot to do it at the beginning of the talk is imagine what you really, really, really wanna do. And, um, and have no doubt in your mind of the importance of initiating something that um, that's that you feel strongly about, no matter what. Um, so this is I'm in the middle, and this is one of the artists on my um, left, and uh, then the other three are artists. And actually, the guy in the white shirt in the middle was one of the people who helped to pull this off, uh, and he has quite a cultural revolution story. But so I'm going to go. And there we are in also a meeting. We had to meet outdoors all the time. Um, we had no place to meet. And, and slowly over time, we got a place to meet. But, um, and some of these people have come from Shanghai and other places. And um, that's what the riverfront looked like. <laughs> it was a mess. <laughs> um, and they were renovating their riverfront and so the artists all had to learn the history of Sichuan and water, the life in the river, the fish that were in it, what it used to be like when it was alive. And um, 
Also, some people went out and we did some teaching in a place where they could see what the healthy water, the healthy um, species that are in living water. But mostly they all met. We, I insisted on us meeting, have a group meeting every week. Um, we went on picnics, we went on tours, we hung out together, we had dinner together. And I had a, everyone's, everyone got like, Five dollars a day, very little money, and um, I did little money like seven thousand dollars, and they had to figure out how to use it. I never curate, and so together they all worked on, you know, and they had discussions about what the most important work was and where the funding would go and how to share it equally, um, and so this piece called Washing Silk took place in this river called the Jinjiang, but it has sewer in it and everything, and when the government saw this piece, they were cheering because this river is very, very beloved. And um, that merchants used to wash their silk and the water was so wonderful, but not, not anymore. Anyway, and this is washing ice, which was a brilliant piece because it melts back to nothing. But again, she froze river water. Now I can't imagine either of these kinds of pieces taking place in my country because of our ooh factor. <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's, it's a different time and place, and that's not a criticism, it's just different cultural differences. Um, so we had to have guards because the old people want to take the ice home to cool their houses and the young people wanted to suck on it. But it became a site of port, poetry and lectures and everything else. And um, I'm, showing this work because bulletin boards, what is the way that most of China got their news? The newspapers would be up on bulletin boards. And um, the, the, the man who did this piece, our faces are being uh, degraded in river water. And then he has information about water and people not having enough water or water being polluted. But a high government official came along and signed the bulletin board. So then we knew we'd won. <laughs> well, we didn't know what we won, but we won, but we got, a, got good attention. Anyway, um, I had invited uh, several Tibetan artists to come down and that's, there's many stories. I ended up in hitchhiking to Tibet illegally. Um, and so this was one of the most beautiful pieces. It's $10, the brooms hang off the bridge and they are over the Brahmaputra river. Uh, and you know, you never know what captures people's imagination and brings a consciousness to them. But this piece really did. And this was another piece by the Tibetans. And um, they didn't show up at all uh, till the end. I knew they would show up big, big and then they, their lanterns on each stick pole. Uh, we had a big feast on the shores of the Brahmaputra. Well, this is almost like ghosts. Uh, so I'll leave that in your brain. So anyway, the reason I was invited to do the Living Water Garden was because of the art pieces. And the government took me to see what they were doing. Uh, and the, they wanted the spirit of the art pieces to continue. So that's the, how that, that happened. I, I had no contract and I received no income. Um, I did get a Bush grant so that I could sort of afford this. And they gave me everything, housing, office, even sometimes food stamps. <laughs> I'm not gonna show a lot of this piece. If you're really curious about it, it's published a lot. And I'm, what I am gonna talk about is, it's a connected water system throughout the park. So no matter how, um, the park was treated, it stayed alive. And I'm gonna talk about that because what we've done is separate all our water system, put them into pipes, separated them. So any place you figure you could find a way to daylight, open, reconnect, that's dynamic and that's totally necessary. Um, this is a living water drop fountain in the center. I made flow forms on every place that the water flowed through so that they could see the movement of water and children would have the play, play space. 
And um, for a long time, it was a science classroom for the schools. It was also very badly built. Um, pumps broke, uh, things started to deteriorate. One mayor wanted to eliminate it. It had no care, but it still kept working. Um, now the taking down of the wall in this one place was the biggest argument that we had because to people who have the wall, it seems like the park, they have all the park all the way to the wall and they couldn't see in their mind's eye that having these steps, you'd also have all the park. And so what I'm gonna talk about right now or insert is that we all live in a highly materialized world where things are solid and we look at them and we wonder how can we change that or how could we have impact on it? And uh, I was talking with Christina about the project they're doing now, getting the change of the, in, getting green infrastructure and water saving things right into the construction. That's, that's fantastic. And there's, we're gonna have to not only understand that nothing is immutable, nothing. It's just a matter of us having the imaginations and the, I would, I don't know if it's courage or, or hope or vision, whatever word you want to attach to it, to take on where you think it's immutable. No, this will never change. People will never change, which we hear all the time. I'm sure you hear it. I hear it all the time. You can't change that. Everybody relies on it, but it, everything is changeable. And um, we can actually morph, dissolve, take down, redo, do what we need to do for, to bring back the complexity and interconnectedness of living, of how we are. Well, I know I live in a much more concretized environment than probably most people on this, <laughs> on this talk, but I, I really find it really hard to figure out what I'll address here. And then suddenly there's a vacant lot. It's, I've been living next to it. Well, could we actually get that lot and turn it into a green space? And it's a huge vacant lot. So we'll see. Um, anyway, that's the man, the hydraulic um, engineer I got to work with. And without him, there would be no park. And there's his wife on the other side. Um, he wrote 35 letters to the government to make it real. The landscape design company didn't want to make it real. But the man who really made this happen was head of the five-year plan. And he's claimed that it's the best thing he ever got to do in his life. But he was, well, the mayor said to him, are you willing to go to jail for this foreign lady? And he said, yes. Now, I don't know how those factors come together that the three of us were in Chengdu at the same time, but that's how the park happened. And we worked from seven in the morning till I dropped dead at, late at night. And I lived up a walk up seven, flights up. Um, so, you know, I, sometimes people think, oh, you know, whatever, something was easy. The, the, the part that made it easy was Zhang Shihai deciding to do it. The actual doing of, of it was, is where you, you know, you're on, you're on, uh, you're on the path, you do it. It was one of the most exciting, biggest blessings in my entire life and for the whole city. So many people just came to live around that. And it's amazing what happens if you do, even like in Portland, when we started the, um, the first school uh, stormwater collection system, that got, you know, 20 schools then started having stormwater collection and then the city took it on. So that was a tiny little project that came out of a workshop that I did in, with the mayor's office in Portland, Oregon. So little tiny things can start things. It's kind of like you're, you're going in the right direction and people like to go in the right direction. So then, you know, there was a woman who wants to do, get the villagers to stop dumping all their sewage and waste and everything in the streams. And that's called the model village. And this is one of our meetings. And Jane Goodall came and she sort of increased the capacity. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned a lot from Jane. Um, Jane never says a discouraging word. Um, I'm in, 
you know, and I've gotten to that point myself where, no, I'm not dystopic. I think we do have a future. I think what it is is up to us and what it is is up to us never hanging back on expecting people to join in on creating their own future. We can do it. Uh, they're, they're drawing drawings for the model village. <laughs> so, uh, meanwhile, occasionally I was back in the States um, and I'm only showing this piece because it has a recycling system for the water system. It wasn't large enough. People didn't believe me that it, we could self-clean the water. But during the drought, it was the only piece in Turtle Bay that was still functioning. And there it is. Now, if you want to know more about it again, this, it has an ag se section, a domestic water section, an industrial water, and it has the amount of water used in those things. It's, uh, it's a whole classroom education. To. And it's something at that time in my life that I like to do is have whatever I did had to be able to be interactive. People climb all over it and contain information. Whoops, did I go backwards? No, this is the industrial section. It says how much water it takes to create steel. So, and again, I, I was part of a, a project in Carnation, Washington, and I insisted on talking to all the different entities that were there, like the mayor, the local indigenous tribe, the um, King, King, King County sponsored this. And I don't know if that had the, con the consequence that actually King County decided to take out the berms and to turn it into a totally wild site for the restoration of the salmon. But I like to think I had, a, had some impact there, but I really don't know. Um, so this is a measuring pole to measure floods and it's um, colored glass and granite. Now I'm gonna, I'm going here, I'm skipping around, but I was, I ended up in Beijing in the Bureau of Hydraulic Engineering and Research. Maybe it was worse, worse than getting a PhD, I'm not sure, but I got a PhD <laughs> in planning and water and I pretty much watched them hardscape every single thing they could. On the other hand, some of the designers took me up on um, that water has to have contact and move. And so there's a whole section in downtown Beijing, which has many different features like this, where the water's lifted up and put through different cleaning systems. And it's, it's really spectacular and they did a good job. Uh, come on. That's another section. I'm just showing you two. I went, ended up working on the um, on a lot, a lot of projects. I ended up watching them transform Beijing because of the Olympics and um, working on the Beijing Olympics, Forest Park. Uh, so we'll go to that. But this is, now see, we could do this on with the Army Corps of Engineers. This is, he laid a frame on top and planted the frame. That cleaned that water by 60%. So there's edible fish in it. The man who designed it always loves to show me. He said, see, I copied your ideas, <laughs> but it's, it's wonderful. And, and they, um, their Army Corps of Engineers said he could do it. And he said, okay, and if it doesn't work, we'll, we'll take it off. So um, while they have many, 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 many water issues in Beijing. This is one example of something that went really well. All right, the forest park is huge. It's bigger than the Presidio Park in San Francisco. Uh, I worked on the water plan and my intention, a singular intention was wetlands and to get a demonstration greenhouse um, working system in it. So it has vast wetlands and it has a greenhouse cleaning system. Um, they also did exactly what they shouldn't have done, which is separate the system so that they could be maintained and there's no flow through. When you have no flow through, pollutions collect in each system and they cannot be taken out. And what I, I'm gonna share from this time in my life is that it was really hard I felt like I was in a trench and um, I'm glad at what got done, but that that's not really where I'm 
where I resonate, where I pulse. And it's taken me a while to get, say, I would say almost over that. I came back in 2006. So meanwhile, a lot, a lot of schools started doing tertiary, in China have done tertiary treatment for their school systems. So young people are growing up with weight wastewater um, and natural systems, even in the center of their schools and universities. So that, that all comes from the Living Water Garden, which was visited by the premier of China and said that was the best thing that happened in China. So there's just a lot of um, like heartbeat beat in that for me in making that part. Going and being in the trenches in Beijing was a different story. It was very rough. Um, when I came back here, um, most people didn't want to hear about the Living Water Garden. And um, I, I put most of what I did in China into boxes and didn't talk about it very much. I was asked to do an installation in the mattress factory in Pittsburgh, and I put a river system in the basin. It's called Only One River. There it is. <laughs> and I found I said, okay, I'll do an installation if I can work in a community. So I had decided not to do things in museums or that, you know, you had to get material, get rid of material and everything like that. Well, the mattress factory couldn't really, didn't have a pathway to a community and I couldn't find a pathway to community. But coincidentally, of course, I met somebody at a totally unrelated event in New York City in Brooklyn. And she told me about Larimer, Pittsburgh. Now, Larimer is the per poorest community in um, Pittsburgh. It's largely black. It was once thriving, but the steel mills um, died. But they're the only community that had a green plan. They, were, they had done, um, what's it called? Transition. They'd had transition workshops and the, that's to create a green plan for food, electricity, and water. So I, with the support of the man who set up the program, I went to everything. I went to barbecues, I went to church, I got to know people. Um, and I was there for on and off for four years. And it was an extraordinary learning experience for me. Um, just as working in China was an extraordinary learning experience where I got to work with people who were, they were determined to do this no matter what they were gonna make that garden. And their knowledge and love of country was so immense. And that relationships also came first, which I forgot to mention, relationships came first. And, um, you know, at first I was like, why is that incompetent person working in this place? And pretty soon I just grew to understand and more than understand to love the system that embraced everybody and everybody got to work at what they were capable of. That children came on their parents' computers after school. We finished a project and piled in a bus and went away for the weekend. So everyone was treated respectfully and pretty humanly. And you don't hear that story here. So anyhow, I started, <clears throat> We started mapping and I started teaching people mapping um, so that they could design their community up and how we could, what we could do if we source the rainwater. Pittsburgh has so much rainwater, it's unbelievable. I mean, there are even cases where the flooding was so big that people drowned in their cars or were swept into huge uh, pipes. So, and Pittsburgh's one of the flat communities, so and what, from which the water runs off. So we could collect all the water. Well, it took me two years just talking about it. And, um, and also building a team that was half people from the community. And then unfortunately, when we got funding, they put a, um, a Pittsburgh person in charge. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not into telling bad stories. So, <laughs> but anyway, we fulfilled the first grant, which was uh, 245,000. And this is um, Ms. Peaks who's showing 
the, the design they made. And on our other side is a woman who learned how to collect stormwater and reduce her water bills by um, 60%. And there's another group, the groups would, were divided into four and we had, I don't know how many of these meetings, maybe six. And at the end of it, we had incredibly good ideas, designs, um, and we're ready to, uh, to, um, pr to propose an Art Place America grant. We'd also built up the relationships with other supportive organizations. And as I said to everyone there, you, I only have my job is that you can talk about and represent what you really want in your community. So learning the vocabulary of how you would talk to the mayor about doing rainwater collecting and creating a civic center based on rainwater and the playground and redesigning their own community. Well, we all learned the hard way. So um, first, this is Larimer, where there's big dots is where the water is most collected. And we map where it flows, the flows are. Uh, at one point it goes over down the street and that could be a waterfall and tremendous amenity. Um, there are the big purple dots there. And um, we got, they were asked to speak to HUD as the team that would speak. And the one glitch, well, there are a couple of glitches. I don't sure I even understand all of them. One is they didn't own 60% of the property. So the city owned the property. The other glitch was the man who was head of the community center. Um, that's had money in some of that property, I'm not sure. But at the point when we got an Art Place America grant of half a million, uh, he kicked me out in 24 hours and dissolved everything and then um, misused the funding. We had designed a civic center with a uh, tree as a cistern that would collect water from underground and from the sky and a playground for children and all kinds of model ecological aspects that would have made Larimer maybe original in the entire United States. So there's the flows of water and we were gonna place the civic center right in here. Um, it's pretty hard to discourage me, but, and also I got a really good look at a class, I always knew there was a horrible class system, but a class system beyond what I knew. And also that the um, foundations are part of the class system, which I knew too, but I didn't ever think they would torpedo something like this and they did. So this is Mary who, um, who, uh, uh, her, her children got her turned on to collecting stormwater and re what, repurposing the rainwater so that their water bill went down. And then she taught all her neighbors and then developers hired her for a little while to, to teach many, but she didn't really like teaching strangers. So she's writing an autobiography. And this is Miss Betty, who is one of the most extraordinary people I got to get got to know. And are kind of like sisters. We scream at each other on the phone. Well, she decided to give her empty lot as a healing garden for the community. And this is before she started that. Now this is the garden and she acquired the land next door. And uh, she's seeking to fund to acquire two more lots. Now this will be the major incredible place in, in Larimer. And um, I just wanted to show it to you because it's uh, it's super special. It's super, I mean, everyone contributes to this effort on all different levels. And on the other hand, she needs money. And, you know, Heinz or Carnegie or one of them could easily give her another $30,000, but they don't do that. So there we are <laughs> at the, the celebration day. And, um, Keepers of the Waters is 
raising more money for her. Uh, it's, a, it's a love project of mine. If you're so inclined, let me know. And I didn't put that up there just for that. I just, uh, I love that project. <laughs> um, and there's a water system and it will be a living water system. And there are, there's gardens, herbal gardens, and there's teaching for young people and programming. Well, <laughs> after my time in uh, Beijing, I wanted to go back to the sacred water site that I'd gone to in 93 before the Living Water Garden, which changed my life. So I went to a place called the God Water and I was gonna give up all my work on water. And I don't know what this symbolizes to people who hear this, but I decided to, um, to go to, that I wanted to go to this place that I had heard about from a connection on the streets in Chengdu. And I got a grant, a Jerome grant, travel grant to go. And I don't know who gives a travel grant to go visit a sacred water site in China. That's all a miracle to me. It's just a miracle. So this isn't that site. Um, I should have had a picture of it. So it's a, it's a place that had been turned into a water bottling factory and um, the water was purported to clean the, help the stomach and the liver. So I met the biologist who was studying that at a university and had found indeed it did reduce cancer and other ailments. Um, and I wanted to visit it and I went, I went there and visited it. And when I sipped the water, I was like strong, you cannot stop your work on water, Betsy. <laughs> it was vibrated through my entire body. So after 13 years later, and I, exhausted in Beijing, and I've lost my perspective on the value of living water as everything disappeared around Beijing that had remnants of that, every spot, every fountain, everything. And um, I decided to go on a trip. And I was told, as I was told when I was gonna go to China, you won't find anything. They won't talk to you because you're a foreigner. And I was going with a um, Han Chinese tour guide and a friend of mine um, so I went <laughs> and my son's a mountain climber. So he said, go talk to this woman. And I talked to Jo Ma and she said, oh yeah. And we went down the road and there's a temple and there's a sacred water site. And then she told me about five others. Well, right then and there, I could have concluded my research. Yes, they are there. And, but I decided to keep on my trip. And so what you do and <laughs> is you have to put your head under, now this all sounds like myth or weird to us, but it's not. You put your head under it for three times. You drink, it's freezing cold. You put some in your water and spit it out for three times now, and then you can drink something. And um, so I decided to travel more. And this water, again, is in the most, one of the most incredible villages uh, valleys I've ever been to. And everywhere we went, we cleaned up the sacred water sites or talked about it with the locals or got what the what was going on. So here's a young monk and he's sourcing water. And I ended up um, meeting a Tibetan woman and we traveled together over five years documenting sacred water sites in Western Sichuan. Now we're at a monastery and he's the head of the monastery and downstream is a place where their water is and it's covered with garbage and tires and everything thrown in the stream. And I'm saying to him, um, can we clean up your stream? <laughs> and uh, he says, yes, and I'll give you my whole school. So, and I also, he told me about their water and how it ha they had no water 30 years ago. And I looked at him and I said, how'd you get it back? And he had a twinkle in his eyes and he said, we replanted the forest. So there, it's all very connected and those connections are part of that culture. And what human beings do is part of it too. So but they didn't realize that plastics are garbage because they never had had bio, all their garbage had been biodegradable. So anyway, we went down the mountain, cleaned up the stream, all these bags, um, this is the school. At first they were picking up leaves, dead leaves, thinking that was garbage. So we had a little, thing about what garbage is. And this monastery is the cleanest place now. Um, and again, it's another place, Brock Dom 
Thalman came there with me and, you know, I don't know how to raise $150,000 so that they can have wastewater treatment for the monastery that would be turned into fertilizer to grow food. It wouldn't even be expensive. I just don't know how to do it, even though I know how to line up the relationships there. So again, these are kind of start places for me or other places. And uh, that's now the Butterwater is very um, celebrated place. And I got, this is a whole other lecture of stories. Uh, I ended up going to one of the headwaters of, of the Yangtze River. They made lunch from the food that's grown out of this extremely incredible place. So it's just, just bursting with life and energy. Uh, and in my hiking around there, I came across this woman and look how happy she is. I don't see a face like that in Manhattan or somewhere else. And there's this water site. And many of these have already disappeared um, due to uh, you know, urban growth and damming and other things like that. So I don't know how long I've been talking. <laughs> see? <laughs> in my efforts to learn about water, I went to conferences and I got to meet a woman named Mei Wan Ho and other people who are doing research into water. Amazing research. And she's written a book, several books, but the last one is The Meaning of Life. But her first book of The Rainbow and the Worm. But if you're curious, just look her up. Um, and she, she was on the verge of, of really designing cities to be in balance water in, water out, um, energy in, energy out. So uh, from, but from her books, uh, this is, this rainbow is in every single new life form, whether it's a worm or a human or a giraffe or, or an ant, every new life form has a complete crystal in it. Now that's an incredible, extraordinary thing. Just extraordinary. I haven't known what to do with that information. Uh, so, uh, um, so, and I just put this up here, but uh, about uh, quantum electromagnetic. Every every life form has it has a pulse, electric pulse. Um, that I think comes, which I think say comes from the mistress of all pulses, which is which is water. Now, there's a way to harness this electromagnetic wave through water that can will clean up water. And I found one physicist who's doing that and I have another idea of how to do it. And that really interests me. I'm happy to go out into that, that field. Um, I've written a book of called Water Talks, which, oh, got a publisher <laughs> on Friday. And, um, you know, one person who, when I mentioned Waterhead Consciousness, there were readers for this book. She didn't like it because I said that. Well, why do we have so attached that we cannot attribute consciousness to anything but ourselves? Whereas our consciousness is so limited compared to the consciousness in water. Um, ooh, I'm getting excited. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Okay, who was laughing? <laughs> I'm just back up a minute. I put I put this here. I actually, based on stones, did a bunch of lithographs, three of them, which I've never shown. And I, I'm going to, I did these in the 80s. Everything is, there is a stone form placed on a litho storm. But I'll just go on. So in my, while I'm trying to digest this reality about water being that dynamic, I just started drawing. I'd come back from China. Um, I hadn't had a studio. I needed to be back with myself in my own heartbeat. And I found myself drawing um, water creating heart. And I have a number of them. I'm just gonna go through them quickly. It, many of them took a very long time to get it right. How do I let myself be in that fluidity, that biodynamic fluidity that is so huge that it's Pulsing my heart. These are different ones. I'm just, whoops, the other one is the, ah! how do I go back now? Uh, okay, got it. That's the apex of the human heart. 
and uh, which is also a fascinating spot because that's where the pumps are set up that pump our heart. And in spite of how we've automized the heart, um, it is a pump that keeps going and it's based on the vortex, which is the only perpetuating form we know in the universe is the vortice. So these are all my different experiments. That's a, a woodcut. Yep. <laughs> Help. Oh no. <laughs> Oops. Oh dear. Uh, let me see, I have to go backwards. I'll go backwards. So I also decided to take apart the different aspects of water. Now, this looks simple. It only took me 150 splashes to get it, the one I wanted. So that's, you know, water creates. Water creates complexity. This isn't the final piece. Um, water never moves in a straight line. It doesn't move in a straight line through a pipe. It doesn't move in a straight line through your rivers. It never moves in a straight line. And the great mistake we are making is make it, trying to move water in a straight line, reducing our rivers, reducing our streams. And this is water, um, life adapts to water, water doesn't adapt to life. And this is the final vortex one, but there's, there's actually nine of these, I'm just showing you five. And at the same time, I was experimenting with um, the morph, the micro and the macro of water. So um, this is very multimedia and this has taken me about four years to evolve reaching for this language or what it is. And I, I don't feel yet that I'm there. I'm still in process. Um, and this is again called galactic burst. And again, these are very recent. I'm burying my soul <laughs> and showing them. And um, that is probably the end, except this I'm focusing on pulse. How do I bring people into the pulse and connect it to, to the natural world, to their rivers with the pulse? Um, and with the knowing that water really is our mistress now. I'm calling her that and some people don't like that, but mistress was the woman in charge. It's been reduced by patriarchy down to something else. So if someone can kind of come up with a better word that water is the governess, the goddess, maybe the governess of the poets, but I want it to be, she is the origin. She is the origin and um, we, we get to be in that fully alive. And what comes next on being a fully alive? And I don't know, except that um, I imagine places all over the world igniting and reclaiming their waters. And so far, I have been invited to a number of places now um, to start projects like that. Why? Because the projects from China have captured people's imagination. And um, that was a really big surprise in my life. And the Living Water Garden in Chengdu is becoming a lightning rod for new activities um, around sustainability and water. And that all just happened in the past six months, but the Living Water Garden in China thing just happened in the past couple of weeks. So you never know what's going to happen <laughs> if you ignite something some, sometime somewhere. Um, I think, I don't know how long I've talked, but yeah. an hour. Okay. <laughs> it's time to stop. <laughs> Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, so inspiring. <laughs> Here, I'll say this. Lotuses are our model. This is a lot. I take pictures of lotuses and I'll do something. Um, and they grow out of the mud. And every university has their lotus pond. <laughs> All right. And if you, <laughs> if you sign into Keepers of the Waters, you'll get the newsletter. And you'll also get that little thing called, please help us stay alive. <laughs> and that's no joke. <laughs> OK, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Betsy.
Thank you for everyone who joined us for our episode of Art and Activism with Betsy. Um, I'm gonna continue um, until 5.30 with Q&A with Betsy. It looks like we had a few, question, like, a few questions in the chat, so I'll start with those. And then um, if anyone's interested in speaking, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, first question that I have is from Linda Trawler. Is she still with us? I can um, see. <laughs> so Linda asks, it seems that uh, working in China was pretty important to your activism visibility. Um, how meaningful was that experience? For you? Um, well, I started in Minnesota, in Duluth. I started in Minnesota and um, I, I piloted. Sorry, I piloted um, the collaborations among artists and what struck me most was it was almost impossible for the artists in Duluth to share with each other and collaborate. The collaboration among the Chinese artists was something I'd never seen or experienced. So, I mean, I didn't, I learned a lot. We have our strengths and they have their strengths and um, their strengths is our relational. And I think we are now challenged, I feel challenged in my own culture to have that relational aspect much deeper. I, Coco and I had that a lot. <laughs> and um, some, you know, there are, there, but it's not the norm here. And um, so it's kind of project based, not forever. Mm -hmm. And, um, I have relationships in China, which I know are forever. And uh, I know I have relationships here that are, but it, it's something, something's very different. That, you know, if you have to share a small amount of money, they shared, they really shared. And they talked to each other about it and they tried to talk the people who wanted too much money down to participate. But, and even if those people didn't get what they wanted, they still helped. Um, businesses and other people contributed a great deal to the success. Uh, so um, it just, I hadn't experienced that. Now, maybe that's just me. <laughs> that's fine. So uh, I think it's a little karmic. Hmm. Um, and I, I was like, I worked in San Antonio and my students, one of my students started the San Antonio River cleanup. And I didn't show these projects. They're all in a book that I uh, will come out somewhat soon, not soon enough. <laughs> um, and we, what we started in Portland was really, really special. It was tiny. So was the student cleanup, which morphed into the annual cleanup of the San Antonio River, which morphed, morphed into their changing the river. So you, you just, within what's possible, um, so I don't know. Did I answer your question? Let's see. Um, let's see. Linda's here right now. Uh, Linda, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Hi, Linda. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to your question? Uh, did I miss the part where she talked about how China changed her opportunity? Well, they because they decided to um, uh, to to you know function here. You had such a great expression. Um, no, I had I things were happening in the United States. Okay. So China was almost an unplanned diversion. <laughs> well, but, I liked it very much because as a photographer. Yeah. We went to Photo Fest, and the one year all the Chinese came, and everybody got shows in China when Beijing was hot. But um, at that time, I had Lyme disease, and I was not really flying around, and I sort of missed the China moment. And there'll be other moments. <laughs> and, and 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 I never knew there was sacred waters in China. So you, this has been beautiful. I, I know you from our collective, but to have a personal conversation with you is amazing. 
And I am a bit torn because I want to take a picture of myself with France, Frances Dormant, who is up for an Academy Award because uh, I admire her. And uh, she also is talking about some of my issues. So I, I had my husband watching the TV and I'm listening to you um, because I want to put that on my Facebook page, how important it is to be. And this is why I'm talking to you, especially you're young and beautiful, but you, you're, we're elderesses. Uh, I'm an elderess and we, we're like carrying on and I love your enthusiasm and in our collective, I just wanted to know you more and I'm, I'm making myself a, big, a bit noise here tonight, oh. but <laughs> really good to just hear what you're saying. Thank you so much, Linda, for your question. I'm gonna move on to Harriet. Thank you so much and thank you for watching. Hi, Harriet. Hi. Uh... No. Christina Bertia invited me to this. And uh, at one point in the early 80s, I worked in Burkina Faso and Ouagadougou. And we were, you know, it's a, it's a dry, it's part of the Sahel. So it might rain two days out of the year. Yeah. And the villagers always said, water is life. Water is life. Without water, there is no health, there is nothing. And of course, the well was for drinking, it was for washing clothes, it was for the animals, it was for everything. And, you know, when it did rain, I mean, you've got all this red clay, and when it did rain in just hours, you'd see this little green coming <laughs> up through the ground. And yeah. it was miraculous. Yeah. It was really miraculous. So. I, I wanted to say that and just appreciate the, how much learning there is from other cultures. Absolutely. And, and We've when been you talked about relational when yeah. you worked with um, the, the community, I believe in, in Indiana, uh, that how important relationships are and cooperation and working together. And I think for our own culture, if we ever could come to the place of mutual respect, cooperation and collaboration, and what we call community building, we'd be <laughs> much happier and we'd more peaceful. <laughs> we'd be much happier. We, you know, it breaks your heart every time. You know, it breaks my heart every time I see someone on the streets. You know, I live in Brooklyn. It breaks my heart and, and uh, you know, just yeah so the one thing my i took my children to china in 89 and they noticed immediately like there were no ads denigrating women there were no sex ads everybody was fed that was when those things were still in place mm -hmm. one thing about sichuan is that it was one of the biggest supporters of mao um, it was also one of the most feudal places where they had the most people um, suffering from the feudal system. And everyone I met was very devoted to what happened. Um, and this, you know, they had gone through it together. This man, sweetest man that gone through the long march, he said, Betsy, we always say we can't do things. We are doing this. They didn't know how to do it. They did. I went, I, went, I had to stay there. I thought I could just come in and add the right details. I stayed for the next year. I had no money and I went to every meeting, no heat. We designed walking every week because the plans were so bad. So, and I, the number of mistakes in that park now, now what I didn't say is that it's going to be renovated, but they were just gonna destroy it and replace it with something else. And everybody who worked on it got together and they formed a meeting and talked to the mayor. And I just got a letter and I, I wrote a, on the three pages and um, the man who wants your dog is going to restore it to a working, literally living water system. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know if I will be able to go back. I mean, I, I want to go back because there's places that were never really designed, mm -hmm. but in the course of it, other things will then happen. Like it's become this lightning rod again. And um, the same with all the work done upstream to get the villages, villagers to have their animal waste turned into methane gas and um, 
and uh, have their villages be sustainable. That spread far and wide for a long period of time. And then the development of resettling everybody somewhere all together started to take over. And I don't know where they're at with that now, but people worked at it really hard and I raised money for that and I sent resource to them and people who wanted to volunteer in China. Okay, what's your skill? Okay, you tried, go do there. Of course, it was much harder than any young person raised in the United States ever anticipated. <laughs> I mean, ever anticipated. <laughs> and, uh, but I would never, I didn't imagine myself doing that. <laughs> I think we're always enriched by our experiences outside of this country. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank there's you. Not, there's knowledge out there. So, who, Fran. <laughs> yes, has anybody uh, uh, followed an economist called William Ruddick in Kenya, Africa, who's working with the Red Cross uh, using community inclusive currency to help build um, and restore during the COVID pandemic. No, but it's glad you told us. <laughs> <laughs> Very happy to get um, that. My husband and I um, are working with a collaborative um, three meetup groups. One is an African-American outdoor adventure group. One is, a, this is my husband, Richard, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and uh, uh, three meetup groups on, 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 uh, on meetup.com uh, to, uh, have a, a project called East E-Steam Love. We have a YouTube channel, collaborative YouTube channel. 